Hi, it's 110 days to election day. This is Elton. He believes in America. He believes in democracy and he believes in this dirty green toy. Welcome to the Lincoln Project Podcast. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. There is not a liberal America, any conservative America. There is the United States of America. Good night and good luck. Folks, welcome back to the Lincoln Project Podcast. I'm Rick Wilson, your host. And joining me today is a very special guest. It is Mike Madrid. Mike is one of the original co-founders of the Lincoln Project, and he is also the smartest guy in this country when it comes to <laughs> understanding Latino voters. And I say that without any exaggeration whatsoever. No, thanks. Because he has written a brilliant new book, which you need to go read. It's called The Latino Century, How America's Largest Minority is Transforming Democracy. And Mike, I want to start out before we talk about the book, uh, first off, saying it is great to be with you. I am yeah. genuinely grateful to reconnect with you, and and I can't wait uh, for you and I to get to be the sour, cynical bastards that we are, and and commiserate about the fact that there are a lot of people on the team that is supposedly against fascism who seem to be hitting each other in the dick every day with hammers instead of fighting Donald Trump. I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to this. I, I, I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival yeah. and right after the debate. I was right. just watching this hand wringing and lighting their hair on fire, running in circles. And I was like, guys, I'm not used to this. Like I'm used to Republican audiences. This is not the behavior that we see. Right. You gotta, you gotta rally the base and, and, and march on. And it doesn't matter how weak or strong your candidates are. It's not the way, can it's not the way campaigns work. Drive forward. Every word of that, it, because it's like, it's like if Donald Trump tomorrow came out and said, hey, I'm a cannibal, everybody. I like to eat barbecued baby. They would all go, yes, barbecued baby is delicious. That's the greatest food in the world. It's healthy and nutritious and part of a growing boy's diet. And Donald Trump leads the way. And yet it's like if Joe Biden takes five seconds longer than they think to answer a question now, it's like, should we throw the country into chaos for another week while we sort this out? I, it, it really did sort of illustrate like a, the fundamental difference between the two parties. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know what you think, Rick. I'd mean, love to get your opinion, but it's also a difference between people who do campaigns for a living and those who kind of just kind of pontificate about them. Uh, and I yeah. don't mean to be dismissive of that. Yeah. There's a role for all that. But, and again, that doesn't mean we blindly go forward with no reason. There's a ton of evidence to suggest that this is the right decision and is nowhere, nowhere near as weak as all of the, 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 the this madness, this panic fever that has taken over. And I mean, we could talk about some of that or whatever you want to talk about. Sure. But I, I am shocked by, by how, by this reaction, because it's not nearly as bad is what people are suggesting, and th as the evidence is coming in now, and and it's showing that right. this still an extraordinarily competitive race, as as we would fucking predict it would be, that that there's just there's just this the 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 the, the, the hand wringing and, and the bedwetting is just it's it's next level, and I'm just not used you to know, it. You know, I, I described it the other day as people who watch too much West Wing and too much House of Cards and think that's really politics. Yeah. And guys just, like us who have been through the trenches over and over and over again, uh, you know, understand that's, that's not how any of this works. That's not it's, how any of it works. It's, and so if you think, if you think campaigns are watching like some random polling outfit in Wisconsin and making right. you know, decisions off of that, it's not how the fucking works, man. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it works. It, and, and the other thing I'm noticing is the tendency now of every single analyst out there to grab one survey it's a really great point they grab one survey and oh. then they 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 apply this sort of super expansive reason go well this means in july by the fucking right way. in july this means x for the whole campaign this means yeah. donald trump will win five million six hundred and seventy two thousand electoral college votes yeah and it just keeps like i i, I the self-destructiveness of it just blows me away folks Biden's going to do what Biden's going to do. None of us listening to this podcast, probably probably very few listening to this podcast, have the last name Biden. And and, yep. and no matter what you think he should do, it's out of our control. Right. You know? And, 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 and look, if, if there is a change and he decides to do it, then, you know, look, then rally and, and run and keep going. Yeah. But, but my God, there's this just, it's become so destructive. 
And I don't know when it ends. I don't know if this goes on to November five or, or I, I just it's just it's foreign to me. I just don't get it. No, the, yeah, there's no there's no way to understand you know, what what they're doing. And, and I and the, you know, it's part of the sort of weird journey we've been on for years and years now. We're the ex Republicans who are now on the side of democracy in the Republic, and, and 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 our allies often are not great at this work. The, or, yeah. or have ever done it before in so right. many circumstances. And that's what's so frustrating is like, let's walk through the data. Let's have that debate. It's a fair debate. Let's have it. Let's, yeah. not, let's, let's not piss on each other in public and, you know, kind of, you know, rant about it on cable news. But my God, let's have the discussion because the, 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 the clamor that has kind of emerged is so disproportionate to what the actual data says. It's just extraordinary. Yeah, the, the the disconnect of the data to the panic is is broad. So, yeah. Mike, I do want to talk about the book today because I I read it. I, I, read it. I think it's an important book, it's and I think it's something that you've been uh, you know way out ahead of the of the curve on with a lot of folks. Not in the there there have been other books about the coming demographic changes in the country, but you've applied a much more sort of practical nuts and bolts political application to thinking about Latino voters than yeah. the sort of pie in the sky that I've seen in a lot of other writings. So talk to us about the origin story of the book, where the Latino population in America is going, and how it's changing, and the impact it's going to have politically in the, this election and the and the coming elections. Yeah, and, and you know, Rick, you and I, uh, you know, in 2020, when we were working on this stuff, we'd have a bunch of late night conversations yep. about it, and you would share some of the experiences and your successes with it. And, and I, I think what happened was after that, you know, we were seeing, we were talking and, and we were raising the alarm bells in 2020 saying, oh, yeah. guys, this shit is happening. Yeah, sure. And there was kind of some denial about it. And so we, the Lincoln Project had a Hispanic summit where we, we gathered, but the right. Republicans gathered all these Latino organizations say, guys, we, I mean, head <laughs> in the game, focus. Here, focus, <laughs> focus, let's get this problem started because we can move these Republicans over. We'll do our, our side of the equation, but you got it. You can't let, you can't lose that many voters. Otherwise it doesn't matter how many Republicans we get. And this this ship did happen, which we were saying was going to happen. And so then I was realizing I, I got to I, I, I got to say something. So let me spend you know 30 years of work and research and, and not just say it's happening. But like, here's the states. Here's the issues. Here's the roadmap. Right. Here's how you do it. Here's how you fix it, because we got to get this done. And I you know raced to get it done before the election because I wanted to be helpful in whatever way I could be. And that right. was the, the impetus of the book. So, you know. One of the things that we've seen over and over again is I think Democrats map over two expectations with Hispanics. They think demographics is destiny. Therefore, they're Hispanic. They're democratic. Right. I think that's a lesson they learned with African-Americans for a long time that they're also having some some issues with now. Right. And I think the other thing is they they tended to overmap economics and undermap culture. It, 100%. And, and, you know, you've talked about this a lot. Talk to folks about why those two things are are like big relevant steer points here. And again, a lot of this is stuff that we were exploring early on in 2020. And, and you know, one of the things, and again, we were just in simpatico with this four years ago, is yeah. this education divide that is changing the coalitions of both parties. Uh, you know, college educated people are rapidly moving towards the Democratic Party. Non-college educated working class folks are equally rapidly moving towards the, De the Republican Party. And it, it was why I remember some of these really important, you know, strategic conversations we were having when you're cutting the ads. It was these are cultural issues. The Lincoln yep. Project stuff was moving those voters on cultural issues. They, we weren't talking about tax cuts. We weren't talking about free market regulations anymore. It was moving these voters who had had it with the party of the Confederacy. They'd had it with the party of, of the crazy. They had, the, had it with the party of what would become the Dobbs decision. Right. We right. knew where this was going. And and and. What my fear was, was that they would not recognize that they were going to lose non-white voters in that process, which they had. And they began at that same time because they believed, I think, the orthodoxy of, of the party. And, and it's not a it's not a criticism. I'm, I'm here to help. Right. Right. <laughs> it, it's to say it's to say you got to get back to some of these working class roots if you're going to hold on to the working class. Right, and the the country is undergoing this demographic transformation where the working class is no longer a, a white working class; it's becoming a brown and a black working class. That's that's who the essential workforce was during COVID. Yep, that's what's changing, 
And you've got to have a, a, a program and a policy framework that speaks specifically to the needs of this community. And if you don't, you're not going to get them on the old immigration saw. You're not going to get them on the old ideas of, of focusing on race and ethnicity right. and, and, and ethnic identity to hold them. You're going to lose them. And, and they did in 2020. And um, and unfortunately, the numbers you know look like there could be some more leakage. It's fixable, by the way, but but times are right, short. Right. So so, Mike, that is a, a, that I think you really hit it there. There is one point that you know the immigration has become in the minds of Republicans their superpower yep. with working class and non college educated white voters. It mm -hmm. has been the thing they rest sixty percent of their campaign on, basically. Um, Talk to us about how that is evolving, immigration as an issue has evolved with Hispanic voters in the country, because I think that is something that our Democratic friends and allies don't pay as much attention to. Um, you know, as, as you said one time, I remember this conversation, like, you go to the Rio Grande Valley and try to sell open borders to Hispanics in the Rio Grande Valley, you're going to get the door slammed in your face. So That's talk to us about, like, how immigration is, is read and misread uh, by both the Republicans and the Democrats as, a, as an issue? That's a great question because what I really want people to understand, and, and again, you know, I'm pretty evidence-based, is show me sure. the math behind this. It, what's happening is the rapid growth of Latino voters that's happening right now, 80% of these new voters are U.S. born. Right. A, a wide swath of that are third, and now, Rick, a, a discernible fourth generation of voters. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like talking to the Irish about the potato famine and trying <laughs> to get them motivated on that. Like, it's not going to work that way anymore. <laughs> and, and, right? It's like the, the future... Right. The, the next 30 years are going to be very different Latino voters than the last 30 years. Right. The last 30 years, this was a, 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 a huge numbers of recently naturalized voters that brought more of a racial and ethnic perspective. They right. were concerned much more about immigration. Now we're talking about the grandchildren, great-grandchildren of these voters, and they're, if they are motivated by immigration, it's on border security. Like when Biden signed that executive action on asylum, 69% of Hispanics agreed with him. 17% mm -hmm. of all Americans agreed. There's no discernible difference anymore. Right. There's a more populist message that there. And, and the fact that Donald Trump is this populist, whatever that means, there's no policy framework. It's just anti everything. Right. Is appealing to men broadly, young men under 30. And 30% of Latino voters, men, male Latino voters, are under 30 years old. So, so that's what's going on. That, and the immigration debate is forever changed. And I think I think Biden's pivot, by the way, immigration's the illegal crossings are dramatically Wait down it. from the sign of that. And that's something they're going to have to be very comfortable leaning into because, and this is where my other fear is, just having dealt with this immigration issue, mm -hmm. this is the issue they're trying to limit the leakage of women on Dobbs on the abortion issue with. Right. Is they're trying to scare white college-educated women with the specter of these men coming across the border who are drug dealers and rapists, right? Mm -hmm. That was specific language for a very specific reason. And it does have a tendency to limit that shift to the left that the Democrats are going to need to be successful in November. We've seen, we've been doing a lot of advertising into Maricopa in Arizona really? and on Dobbs and it's been effective, yeah. but it has not, it has not shown the same push as the same advertising set that we've been doing in Wisconsin on Dobbs. There right. it has been blowing the doors off. It's successful in Maricopa, very strong there, but in Wisconsin, it's like you push the Dobbs button. It's particularly with, with, with affluent Republican women, uh -huh. and the game is over. It's done. In Arizona, they're still like, yeah, but I'm worried about Precisely. crime, which, which we've mapped back to immigration fears of you know illegal border crossing because they're getting pounded with that message right now. And Rick, that's the perfect demographic slices that you guys should be looking at because that's the race. That's gonna, that, those margins are going to determine the race. Is the Democrats believe, with, with, with good reason, they can get a much more significant share of the female vote right. than we got in 2020. Uh, Dobbs changed that. The, the special elections, the midterms all proved that. Yep. The, the question is, can we limit that movement to the right? And that's where you're going to need something a little bit more economic and populist and border security. And if they're not afraid to run that, they, they will should be successful. 
And it, that's what you just outlined is exactly the way I'm looking at the race. I'm not worried about Democratic weakness in the base right now. That's all going to fucking It'll come home. It'll, It'll come, come home. And Biden increased his share with independents in the New York Times Seattle poll after the debate. Mm -hmm. His numbers are moving in the right way with the polling averages. Now, the Republican base consolidated, especially after the shooting. And, 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 and that, you can't, that was going to happen. Maybe sure. it happened a little bit earlier, but that's going to happen. But Democrats are going to come home. And when they do, you've got a very, very competitive race, and you got to start looking at the demographics, not the vibes and the, you know, this qualitative dial testing focus group, fuzzy feely. I talked to eight voters, and this is what they said. Right. No one runs races like that. Yeah. No I, 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 anybody, anybody who comes in and says, I talked to, to four people in a diner in pencil. No, stop God, it. Man. That's not science, God. people. No. Um, so we've got in the, in the Hispanic heavy states in nevada and arizona we have very hot races yeah. um we've also seen a, an increasing number of hispanic voters in two of the other states georgia and north carolina yeah. um and one of the things that you know you are certainly an expert on and i've always you know learned growing up in florida hispanic politics right right which used to be by the way everybody it used to just be the cubans and right. now it's cubans it's puerto ricans it's venezuelans it's caribbean it is Ecuadorians are, are yeah. a growing number in, yeah. in Florida politics. In fact, the U.S. Senate candidate who is running against Rick Scott and the Democratic Party is from Ecuador. Yeah. And it, the, yeah. it has changed the game everywhere. Talk about the diversity of, of the Hispanic populations that are shifting and changing all these states because the, the old model in people's heads was if it was west of the Mississippi, it was just Mexicans. If it was right. east of the Mississippi, it was just Cubans Correct. And, and Puerto Ricans. And that is no longer the case. No, it's not. And again, that's a great way to look at it, right? There's There's been a lot of, for the past 30 years, again, there's been this kind of over-reliance on the Cuban vote in Florida yep. and in national politics. Cubans are only about 4 or 5% of the national Latino right. electorate. 60% are Mexican-American. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where the massive growth is happening. Right. And Florida is a, a cool outlier. I mean, I love it because I'm a, I'm a nerd, right? So right. it's like looking at this and trying to learn all that I can. But but it's definitely very, very, very unique. Oh, yeah. North Carolina, it's Mexican voters. Wisconsin, yep. it's Mexican voters. It's mm -hmm. all outside of the margin of what the victory is going to be. Sure. And by the way, nobody's looking at a Hispanic subsample in Wisconsin or North Carolina where there are hundreds of thousands of Hispanic voters and the margin of victory is going to be less than 30,000 in both of those states. Right. Like, this is a huge opportunity for Biden's team. Even if you even if you only win 55% of that vote, you, you're still closing the gap decisively with right. those kind of numbers. But that's a really good point about North Carolina particularly because, and Wisconsin too, but North Carolina particularly because that race is so hot right now in this, on, the, on, the, on the governor's race. That is so crazy there. There's an activation potential, I think, for a lot of those Hispanic voters um, in North Carolina. Interestingly, also, I think it's going to change the map there in the coming Demo in the coming redistricting cycles because Western North Carolina was old and very, 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 very white and very old, and now it's going to be much younger and much more Hispanic. That's exactly right, and I, that's why I dedicate a chapter to the book there. I, I go through some of the math, which may date the book in a year or two, but. Again, the book is written for this moment. It's sure. to say, wait a second. If you do that, if you activate it, if you invest in resources on the ground and turn this vote out, 250, 300,000 Hispanic voters in a race that's going to be won or lost by probably 35, 40, maybe 50,000 votes, you got a good shot here because no one's got a subsample in their polling. No one's even looking at it. Right. It's kind of the sleeper vote that nobody's looked at. It will break Democratic. The question is how much. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that's where I think you know Biden and his people, and they are. I mean, Biden's people are on the ground there in North Carolina. And they seem to be working, yeah. so that's good news. I have heard they've got a lot of. They, they, I've heard they've got a lot of investment in, in North Carolina on the operational side. I hope mm -hmm. that's where they're putting some of that heat because that would be that would be a game changer if you brought North Carolina. I mean, the Trump folks had it in their in their column in their mental map for a long time. I've never been as confident of, that it was that it was in their pocket as they have, especially because Mark Robinson is certifiably fucking insane. Yeah, and I mean, if, if that doesn't help, I don't know what does. But you right. remember, we, we were testing, we were pushing North Carolina oh, a yeah. lot, and then when the numbers changed, we're like, let's go to Georgia. Yep. The analytics are saying we can we win were right to, we were, Brother, we were right to go to Georgia. That was we the right, right call. You, you made that call. And that was one of the classic game of small numbers calls that you made. 
And it was like, I remember we, 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 we wanted Florida to work. It didn't work. We wanted North Carolina to work. It wasn't going to work. And, and everything of those two states that went into Georgia made a difference, not only in the, in the, in the general, but in the, in the specials. That's uh, exactly right. Seats. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's definitely, I, I think definitely North Carolina is, it's gotta be on the hot list in this, in this thing. Yeah. And look, there's a lot of, you know, people saying you can't be expansive right now. You can't be looking at the map. Look, every election is different. And you've got to look at every one the way sure. your cards are played, not not last year's deck, not last year's hand. You've got to look at the way they are right now. I don't think North Carolina is 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 an, you know a huge gamble when you should be worried about Michigan or whatever. It, it's it's right there. Right. So yeah, you've and, got to look at it that way. And folks, it's relatively low cost. I mean, oh, those hat too. Investment, we're compared to, compared to Nevada? <laughs> yeah, compared precisely. to Wisconsin and Michigan? <laughs> yeah, and being, able to break, and being able to break through that, that environment is just cheaper. It just makes it, it's an early yeah. vote state. There's a whole lot of reasons why tactically you can go into North Carolina and make a big difference. And I, I would say I hope they're looking at it, but I, I, it, it sure sounds like they are, which is great. I, it does. It does sound like they are. So one of the things that, that, that I'm, uh, I want to get folks, make sure they understand, the ways that that the Latino voters are reached and communicated with yeah. are not as traditional. Uh, you know, the, the 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 things that blew people away that they discovered in 2020 was like so many voters in the in the Latino community are getting their news through WhatsApp. They're getting yeah. their news in ways that and news and information about politics in ways that are not. Hey, I'm sitting on to watch MSNBC or CNN tonight for for two hours. Talk to us about where that information flow works, why the disinformation in that in those channels is yeah. so effective and what Democrats can be doing to win those, to get into those those uh, channels of communication. So you have to understand, again, as younger people, and sometimes it's better to look at Latinos not like as an ethnic group, but just as a younger generation cohort mm -hmm. because it is so decisively young. Where are younger people getting their information at and then kind of lay on sort of the racial ethnic stuff? So right over over um uh over measure on youtube on 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 handheld mobile devices yeah the, the targeting you can do that way is exponentially more impactful the whatsapp channels and this is again this was your idea probably as a floridian but you're like you want to get puerto ricans madrid let's go buy on the island because right. it's cheap <laughs> which is genius <laughs> of that. it's just you buy on the island because they're communicating and sharing all that stuff into the panhand or into the uh, the corridor there. The yeah, I and I four, yeah, I four corridor, and, and brilliant. Like I, that, I would never have known that. And that that's the type of tactic that we're going to have to get increasingly better at as campaign yeah. professionals to realize this is a different demographic. There are regional variances, and it was just really smart, and it was it was cheap because we're buying a Puerto Rico, and yeah. all of that information was was uh, traveling by WhatsApp onto these voters. You know, the other day somebody said to me. And this is one of those things that's like speaking, speaking Pashto to me. She said, you know, you really need to figure out how to get into Dominican and Puerto Rican TikTok. I'm like, I'm a 60 year old white guy from North Florida. That is a specialty area that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to outsource that for you. I'm going to see, I will see that ground. I'm old to develop that specialty. I'm not going to. Somebody's going to make a billion dollars yeah. on that. It ain't going to be us, I'm afraid. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, so let's talk a little bit broadly about the campaign as we wrap yeah. up here, because we, yeah. we try to go a half an hour on this show and I try to be disciplined and not over, over, overburden the time. No. So the assassination attempt, my theory yeah. of the case, when you get, you get yours, I think because the guy was a Republican and a loner, this was not the, this was not the, the great left-wing conspiracy rhetoric of violence that they thought it was. It was a weirdo. Uh -huh. Um, I think that is sort of passed. I think the convention will give him a bump. Where do you see the race two weeks from now, basically? Because I think yeah. we're at a very interesting inflection point. Yeah, and like I said, if, if the Democrats can get out of their circular firing squad, I think that the, the Democratic base will start to congeal and come home. Right. A, lot of, a lot of the weakness... By the way, Biden's weaknesses in the polling on his own base is not new. It's no. been there since he was elected. And the funny thing about it is, even though he has had this historical weakness in his polling, it is dramatically overperformed on election day. This yep. dude's getting ninety percent of 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 uh, of the vote share in primaries where he had Marion Williamson and Dean Phillips running against him. Right. 
Donald Trump, by the way, was always polling with very secure base. Everything looked like he's getting 90% plus of the vote, and he's losing 20% on election day. Right. So, you know, Biden has a polling weakness that doesn't manifest on election day. Donald Trump has an election day weakness that isn't manifesting in polling. A lot of that has to do with the changing coalitions that I don't think people are paying attention to. And that's something that people really have to understand is an incredibly important data right. point. You can discern whatever the hell you want out of it, but you can't ignore it. And when you start looking at, you know, you, these battleground polls that show like Ruben Gallego up seven yep. and then and then Joe Biden down six, it's like there's not 13 percent of the electorate that is a Trump Gallego voter. No, that's that's voter. fucking nonsense. Right? right. And if you go battleground by battleground and realize that base vote will come home. In its normal trajectory, it is July. They even haven't, haven't even had the convention yet. You saw Biden's numbers, job approvals, and everything going up as we neared into the midterms. The same dynamic is going to happen. So I believe this race is in a very tight historical range. It's going to be a close election very. like last one was. Biden was up six or seven, and we were telling people it's going to be a close it's race. Be close it's race. not going to be a blowout. This is going to be a close race. It's not going to be a blowout in either direction. And I think, again, this is going to come down to a handful of states with people who've got a, the tactical advantage of the ground game. And the truth of the matter is, with two historically unpopular candidates, wherever the focus is on the last part of this race, that candidate's probably going to lose. So you've got to, you've got to keep your fire focused, man. You can't just let you can't be firing any your own guys and shooting them in the back while they're trying to take the hill. You've got to stay focused and keep the fire offensively pressed every moment of every day in a negatively charged environment because both of these candidates, again, have high negatives. People are voting against the, uh, the other person as much as they're voting for their own candidate. Yep. It's why they're able and willing to look past their own candidate's deficiencies. This idea that because 73 or 75 or 80... 100% of people think he's too old doesn't mean he's not going to win. It, Correct. it just doesn't. That's not the same fucking question. And, and that's <laughs> not the way campaigns work. Like, get your head out and just start moving. I, and, and I, yeah. I tell my Democratic friends this all the time. If this race is turned into a referendum on Donald Trump, like we did in 2020, in every conversation, it's America or Trump. Do you want four more years of that thing? Yeah. Joe Biden will blow him the fuck out of the water. It yeah. will be over. If yeah. it's a referendum on Joe Biden, it's a crapshoot. Maybe not a good crapshoot. If it's a referendum on Donald Trump, let's remember, folks, he got 46.2% of the vote. That's his peak. That's his, that's that's his ceiling. ceiling. Yes. That's, that's his that's, ceiling. That's the right way to look at the race. And what you're seeing in the analytics, I mean, you, you're just saying, in yep. Wisconsin, you're running these issues. It's moving voters. They're there. You know, if you're going to talk about Dobbs to college-educated women, you're going to get them. Yep. And that's something that was a, a that's a weapon we did not have at our disposal no. in the 2020 race. No, and it, it 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 really blew them out in in 2022. In the 17 races we were able to to participate in in, in 2022, that was the killer app. That was the thing that that you know when a Doug Mastriano got out there and talked about how great how great it was, we could see it in the tracking. How right. it was just draining the life out of every other Democratic candidate in the field. When you've yeah. got Kerry Lake and Blake Masters in Arizona talking about it, it's draining the life out of their campaigns, and we and we saw it. Weirdly, because you know you you and I both know this. Uh, issues have a we have a shorter attention span in this country than we used to. Mm -hmm. But man, Dobbs is not a short attention span question. It is. It it's just essential. sits and sits and sits and sits. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sign of a worldview. And that's what people need to understand is w people believe on both sides that their worldview is being threatened. Right. The stakes are extraordinarily high. And that's why, you know, Republicans in part, while they will look past their candidate being a convicted felon in a sexual assault con, blah, 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 right. blah, 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 blah. And they will look past the fact that, that Biden is an old guy. They, and they know that they, but they're like, we get it, but we understand the stakes. So you can ask all these questions about his deficiencies, and you're going to get wide margins saying that. But at the end of the poll, if you ask who you're voting for, I'm voting for him. Like that's my guy. That's our guy. He's our. He's the guy who won last time, and he's the guy we're with this time. And I think that that's really the the contours of the race are just they're, they're much more set in stone than people realize, and it's why focus and energy 
is absolutely critical heading into the stretch of this thing. Well, Mike Madrid, I am proud to call you a, a co-founder of the Lincoln Project wow. and a friend. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Folks, the book is The Latino Century, How America's Largest Minority is Transforming Democracy. Buy it, read it, internalize it, use it. Um, Mike, where can people find you on social media? They can still find me on Twitter or X or whatever we call it now, at Madrid underscore Mike. I write about the kind of the data of the race quite a bit, and I'll be talking about Latino dynamics. And uh, if I can be helpful, follow, give me a follow and uh, see, see if I can help uh, calm some nerves out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. And uh, we will yeah. talk to you again very soon. Thanks, Rick. Folks, you all know we are slaves to the algorithm. I need you to do me a big favor. Like, subscribe, share this content with your friends. It helps get the Lincoln Project's message out to many, many more people. We really appreciate it. We're very grateful for everyone who follows, comments, likes, subscribes, shares, the whole thing. So thank you. We'll see you again next time. Good luck.